Good morning, everyone. Very warm welcome to you all. Um, all the shirt sleeves and so on. It seems summer has arrived, so it's great to see you all here. And I think summer has arrived because quite a number of folk are away, but we're, I'm personally very glad not to talk to myself. So uh, it's lovely to have you with us as we gather to worship God and to focus on him. Just a few announcements. First of all, thank you to everyone, uh, especially to the Get Connected team for a lovely barbecue on Friday evening. Uh, the first rain in weeks couldn't dampen the occasion and uh, it was um, really, really helpful, lovely time and I know that everybody uh, really enjoyed it. I want to say thank you as well to, to everyone uh, for your continued contribution to the Arma Food Bank. Our most recent contribution was almost 22 kilograms of food and other items, and we really appreciate the fact that you support this. So we, we have a concern locally, which we seek to assist with, but we also want to assist across the island of Ireland and overseas, and if you haven't done so already, I want to remind you perhaps to use your first United Appeal envelope, and we commend that to you all. Then we're back again this evening at seven o'clock. It's our pre-communion service. Normally we would have that on the Wednesday night prior to communion, which will be next Sunday morning. Um, the General Assembly went and moved itself and uh, got in our way. So we're having a pre-communion service tonight. We focus on the cross and what Jesus has done for us. I'll be conducting that. We'll meet for prayer at half past six in the Memorial Hall. And then we remind uh, Holiday Bible Club uh, leaders uh, that uh, there'll be a wee uh, preparation tonight for Holiday Bible Club, which begins tomorrow evening, the 19th, through to Wednesday, the 21st of June. It's from half past six until eight o'clock. And we commend that to all our primary school aged children. And if you know of others, then invite them along, please. So Holiday Bible Club starts tomorrow night at 6.30. The General Assembly is on this week, and uh, something which may be of note for all of us, if you're available, on Thursday evening, there is an evening celebration. It's at 7.45 in the Assembly Hall, uh, in uh, Assembly Buildings in Belfast, formerly known as Church House, which we probably still would know it as. Uh, the, the speaker on Thursday night is the Reverend John T. Rhodes, he is a minister of a Presbyterian congregation in Leeds, a very, very good communicator, and be well worth coming along to that if you're free on Thursday evening. And then we remind you that the Mal magazine will be relaunched in the autumn time under our new editor, Laura Auld, and articles for the magazine can either be hard copy or sent electronically, and that those should be in, please, by the 3rd of July. So these are all our announcements. Now let us worship God. We begin our worship of him as we focus on God and sing to his praise. Praise the Lord, you heavens adore him. Let's stand and sing.
We have sung our praise to God, and now we're going to talk and bring praise to him in our prayers. Let's all pray. Loving God and our Heavenly Father, we're gathered here this morning in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. And we have come to praise you who is God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We come to join with the angels in glory. And we, like creation, seek to declare your glory. But even more than creation, we thank you that we can come with understanding. For we know you, for you've revealed yourself to us in your Son. And you show us your character, your personality, your being in your word. So we know that we're coming to a God who is just and holy, who is true and loving who is compassionate and forgiving. We thank you, O God, that you do all things well. We thank you that you are perfect and without sin. We thank you that you are the truth and you tell the truth. We thank you that you love us and that you are compassionate toward us and, wonder of wonders, you are forgiving of our sins and our failings through your Son because of his perfect life and his death on the cross. And when we consider your perfection, we come and confess our sins. We recognize we have failed you. We understand that we have let you down. We understand that we have done things we shouldn't. And we don't do things that we should. Lord, we also know that if we think we are without sin, then we're deluding ourselves. And yet, there is forgiveness in Jesus. And so we respond again with praise and thanksgiving and worship. Lord, we pray as we have gathered today, taken time to be here, to be together, to praise your name. We pray, O oh Lord, that we will know your presence and your grace in our lives, because we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to encourage you to open your Bibles, please, at Mark's Gospel. We return to Mark chapter 1, and we're going to read from verse 35 through to the end of the chapter. Mark chapter 1, verse 35. This is God's word. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. Simon, that's Peter, as we might better know him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, if you are willing you can make me clean. Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cured. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. 
Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. And we'll finish our reading here, and we pray that God would bless it to all our hearts. Now, I'm pleased to see there's a few of our young folk here this morning. Do you want to come on up to the front? I'm going to come down now and speak to you. Morning, Lucy. You all right? Good. You all right, Clara? Good. You all right, Joel? Great. Great. Good to have you here this morning. I'd be very, very lonely standing here if it wasn't for you with me. Tell me, have you ever been sick? Yeah. What sort of, you have, have you ever, you, 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 I've been sick in the You're sick in a hotel room? Oh, and everybody had it. Ooh. Did you give it? That's very generous. Yes. We gave it to Ulster. Oh, right. So chucking for Ulster all over the place. Right. Oh, dear. It's not nice. Sure, it's not. No, it's horrible. It's horrible taste and all that. What about you, Joel? Have you ever been sick like that? Yeah. We all have, haven't we? Yeah, yeah. You need to clean your teeth quickly, don't you? But then sometimes you get other things. You can get, you know, colds and so on and all sorts of things. And we've, chicken pox, you've had chicken pox, yep. You haven't had it. You've had it, Clara, haven't you? Yep. Have you had chicken pox yet, Joel? Wow, good. It's good to get it out of the way, I think, so I'm told. I've had it too. Now look then, I'm so old. I mean, I had whooping cough, which you probably never even heard of. Yeah, it doesn't, it barely doesn't exist anymore. And uh, <laughs> um, what else? Oh, all sorts of things. Mumps, of course. Lots of people. Everybody here, anybody had mumps before? Yeah. L mumps is where the glands in your neck all swell up and you get a bit of a bap jaw, you know. So, and it's, it's very infectious and you can pass it on. But if you get your MMR, you, see, you don't get it anymore. It's a jab you get, and you cried whenever you got it, but you're okay now. <laughs> so, but anyway, we've all been sick, haven't we? Whether it's chicken pox or whether we're, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. All of these things, they're not a bit nice. Think what it would be like, though, if you were sick and you, all the time, and you were told, because you have this sickness, you're not allowed to be with other people. It's not even that, let's say you had the sickness of the man in the story in the Bible, which is leprosy. If you had leprosy, it's not even that you would have to sit over there. You wouldn't even be allowed into the building. You would have to stay outside. There's a Presbyterian church. There would be nobody to look after you, Clara. You'd be left on your own. You'd be pushed away from the family. Well, Lewis would be okay. It's only when you're bigger usually it happens. So, But there's big people and they get this sickness and they're away from their family and they're not allowed to go near people because what they had, other people could catch. And they had to go around and if people came near, they had to shout out, unclean, unclean. And people knew to stay away from them. Wouldn't that be terrible? to be away from family and to be away from friends and no cure, nothing to help us to get better. And that's what happened in the story. And this man came to Jesus and he got down on his knees and he said to Jesus, can you do something please and help me? And what did Jesus do? Can anybody remember when we were reading, what did he do? Yep. Clean. Brilliant. He touched him and he said, I am willing, you're now clean. That is absolutely right. But what did Jesus do? He touched him. These are people that had to stay away from everybody else, that nobody else would go near, and they couldn't go near other people. And Jesus touched them. 
that's an amazing thing because Jesus was saying, look, it's not the sickness that I'm worried about. He was more concerned. He cared for the person. And that's why Jesus came. That's a wee story to help us understand, to know why Jesus came to our world. Because we're all unclean. It's not that we've got a sickness like that, although sometimes we get sick. What's the sickness that we've all got? Sin. We've all a sickness called sin. And Jesus came to take that away. And so when we read about Jesus touching a man who's unclean, that's Jesus' way of saying, this is what I've come to do for us all, to take away our sin. And how did Jesus do that? By touching him. And how did Jesus take away the wrong in us? By dying on the cross. Absolutely, Lucy. By dying on the cross. Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sickness our sickness in our hearts, the sin, the wrong things that we've done. Isn't that an amazing thing, boys and girls? That's what Jesus came to do. And that's why we come together on Sunday as his people to say thank you to him, to praise him, to sing to him, to talk to him, and to be with those who want to do that. It's Father's Day, it is. Why is it Father's Day? Well, it was basically picked as a random date, basically. So, well, pretty much, it's yeah. A random day. It's a random day, but when you think about that too, Clara, and I appreciate you mentioning Father's Day, because that man in the story, the leper, if he was a daddy, he couldn't hug his wee girls, his wee boys, because he had to be away from them. So when Jesus made him clean, he was able to go back to his family. And that's a most lovely, lovely thing. So Jesus came to take away our sin and to make us to be friends with him and part of his family. And so even today on Father's Day, we can say thank you to Jesus for what he has done for us. So I know that's a very serious story, isn't it? But look, we all get sick, and hopefully if we get sick, we'll get over it very quickly. But whatever, we know that the biggest problem is sin in here, and that's why Jesus came to save us. So we're going to be thinking about that as we sing uh, your praise. We're going to sing our hymn of the month, and it's only a holy God. Only the holy, perfect God could do something about our sins. So we sang it a couple of weeks ago and we're singing it this week, and we're going to sing it again next week. So we'll stand together with everybody else, and we'll sing this, and uh, the praise leaders will help us in that.
Now let's continue to worship God as we bring our morning tithes and offerings. Let's talk together to God. Let's pray. Gracious God, on this Father's Day and where the day came from, we don't really know, but we recognize and give thanks for fathers. And we pray, O Lord, that you would help fathers across our congregation to lead their families with grace and wisdom. And we pray too, O God, that on a day such as this, we would also see the great and the perfect Father, the Father of all, the one who loves us and in his Son came to this world. We pray, our Father, that you will bless us and enable us to live and serve you. And Lord, we pray this morning as well for our Bible club, which begins tomorrow evening. We pray that it will be a blessing to our children and to many other children who would come. We pray as well that it would be an encouragement to our families. We give you thanks to God for the, the children and the young people who are part of our fellowship here. And we thank you, Lord, for their knowledge of you and that so many of them have come to know Jesus. And we pray, O oh Lord, that that would be the experience they all would have. And to that end, Lord, we pray that even for the Bible Club tomorrow night, that that would contribute to it, and especially as they learn more and more during the week. We pray, O oh Lord, that you will continue to enable parents and enable us as the church family here to show and to provide instruction and guidance and leadership and encouragement to our children, to our young people, and to our families, that they would know your grace and peace. And we pray as well, O oh Lord, this morning for the work of our General Assembly as it will begin on Wednesday evening. Lord, it might seem to be far from here and far from us, but decisions taking there affect us all. And we pray that those decisions would honor Jesus. We thank you, O oh Lord, that we are part of a denomination which honors Jesus and which seeks to glorify him and which seeks to live in accordance with your will in our fallen world. Lord, we do not seek to puff ourselves up, but we pray that we would be humble men and women who live for Jesus and show him to our world. To that end, O oh God, we pray that you will continue to bless us together and draw us closer to one another and closer to Jesus, because we pray these things in his precious name. Amen. Let's sing again, shall we? Uh, it's a former hymn of the month, Ancient of Days, focusing on, on the greatness of our God, and then the young folk can head on, head on out to junior church after this praise. <laughs>
Nostalgia is defined in one dictionary as an affectionate feeling you have for the past, especially for a particularly happy time. You know what it's like when you get together with friends, particularly friends that you've had for a long time, and uh, the, the, the sentence or the question begins, do you remember? And whatever it is you remember, and everyone says, oh, yes, yes, remember that. And particularly when it's happy occasions, we remember these things. That's, that's nostalgia. And we look back with, with gratitude and, and that warm, fuzzy feeling that we have in regard to these things. And whilst it's not exactly nostalgia, because we weren't there, we perhaps can look back to the time when our Lord walked this earth with a similar sense or, or feeling we might have that it would have been better to have been a Christian then. What would it like been like to have been a follower of Jesus, to see him, to hear him, to see the miracles that he performed. And we could have that sort of almost nostalgic perspective and things that, oh, that would have been great, wouldn't it? If only we had witnessed Jesus teach and heal our lives, perhaps we might think as his followers would have been markedly different and better than it is. And yes, don't get me wrong, it would have been astonishing, it would have been awesome to see the Lord in the flesh, to hear him preach, to have seen him perform miracles. And yet, the scriptures are very, very clear. He is the same Lord who is with us this morning, here in this place by his Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, is with us, for he's promised to be with us, and God keeps his promises. God is with us, and that same God is at work in us and in our fellowship who walked this world clothed in flesh. And so as we consider these events which we read about this morning, uh, from the life of Jesus. We need to think about these things as they're recorded for us by inspiration of the Holy Spirit and as written down by Mark. They're there at God's command for us that this is God's word for us today in whatever circumstance we find ourselves today. The same God is at work in our hearts and lives here. So it's, it's not that we're second-class Christians because we didn't see Jesus. But what we learn from when Jesus walked this earth is directly applicable to our lives here and now. And there are two real principles here that we can see. And the first one is the Lord prays. And that's what it says in verses 35 to 39, where it said, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Jesus' ministry in Capernaum has had a dramatic effect on the lives of the people. He has healed many. He has driven out an evil spirit. He has called his first disciples. He is beginning his earthly ministry in, in a way which is astonishing and dynamic and which has really attracted the attention of so many people in that little place. And Jesus went to minister in Capernaum because of its strategic location and because it was a, a very helpful base from which to start to reach out around. And it has had a huge impact already, transforming people's lives, making their lives qualitatively better, to give them hope and assurance and peace it, that they simply didn't have before. And this is now repeated in towns across northern Galilee. 
And just as in verse 33 we read, the whole town had converged on Jesus. So now, as we see in verse 37, everyone is looking for him. He is the center of everything. He can hardly go anywhere. And the reason for that? Because Jesus healed people who were diseased or who were afflicted by unclean or evil spirits. Jesus makes an impact on people's lives. He changes lives. And he makes an impact on our lives too. He changes our life. For when we come in faith and receive the gift of salvation that Jesus won for us on the cross and given to us by his Holy Spirit, it transforms our lives. We are not the same. We are completely different new creatures, new creation. It's not just that we're the same person that have a bit of an add-on, a bolt-on to our lives. We're new. It's different, completely different. But for some people, the impact of Jesus on their life is one of rejection. They turn their backs on him. They want nothing to do with him. And there are so many in our society today, and that is exactly how they are. But I've got to say, we can sit in here and reject him too. Because we're not engaging with our minds and our hearts in our worship and praise of him. It's a surface thing. We come here and it doesn't make a difference to our lives. Many, many people were to clearly and unambiguously turn their backs on Jesus later in his ministry because they discovered actually what it meant to be a follower of Jesus Christ. It was a commitment, frankly, that they were not prepared to bear. They were not prepared to accept what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. For other people, Jesus actually excites them. But sadly, for many people, their response to Jesus was what they perceive that they get out of it. What's in it for me? Now, I've got to be honest, that is the natural response of a fallen human heart. What's in it for me? What do I get from this? And yet the wonder of the gospel is that God in his grace gives us his forgiveness, gives us his love, gives us his mercy through his son Jesus Christ, even when we selfishly see it in that light. What's in it for me? Well, he still gives us grace and forgiveness. But God's grace and forgiveness, for that is what Jesus ultimately offers to us, is to change us utterly, as we will discover when we think about how he heals diseases, and particularly in relation to the disease that he heals a little later in our story. There was an advert for a brewing company in the 1970s, which said that this company's product, quote, refreshes the parts other beers cannot reach. You may remember that if you're old enough. Let me tell you, this is a lie. But it does actually ask a very valid question. Because as we need to, we need to reflect upon that as it relates to our lives as a follower of Jesus Christ, what difference to our lives does being a Christian make? What difference does it make to our lives to be a follower of Jesus? Because God's grace should reach the parts of our hearts and our minds that nothing else can reach. God's grace changes how we think 
God's grace changes how we speak. God's grace changes how we act. It is life transforming so that even when we contribute to the life of the church, the work of God's grace transforms it from doing things to serving. And it's in that context that Jesus, that morning after the dramatic events when he had healed many people, whenever he drove out many demons and unclean spirits, the next morning Jesus got up and went out of the house before dawn and he went off to a solitary place and there he prayed. The very Son of God went aside to pray. It is literally a desert place he went to. And you've got a question whether Jesus was being tempted again to welcome the interest of the crowds. You know what it's like. We all like to be liked. We all like to be appreciated. We all like people to say nice things about us. But that's not why we do what we do. We do it because we love Jesus and we seek to serve Jesus and we seek to honor Jesus. That's why prayer is to be at the heart of what we do. That's why we gather before our evening service this evening at half past five in the memorial hall, we will meet together to pray and exhort you if you're coming tonight to come to pray. It's why we seek God's face day by day in our quiet times. The old-fashioned language of the, of the Puritans described about going into your closet, a quiet place, away from distraction, as much as it is possible, to talk to God and for him to talk to you as you read his word. Jesus went to a desert place because it would have been the temptation to Jesus to bask in the crowds and the adoration of the people. Aren't you great? Thank you so much for what you're doing. And Jesus went aside in order to honor his Father. And we too like appreciation. We like to feel good because we're liked. That's not Jesus' way. He makes it very clear that service to the church is about other people but ultimately it's about God's glory and God's honor. And we need to pray. We need to pray that God would guard our hearts and our minds, that God's grace would reach all the parts of our lives, rooting out those things where we put self first and instead replace it with a love for Jesus Christ and his people. Jesus' reply to the news that the disciples brought that everyone is looking for you was actually to leave that place and to go elsewhere because he states his purpose for coming. Look at verse 38. Let us go somewhere else so I can reach there also. And we need to be very careful and take careful note that whenever Jesus tells us his purpose for coming, that's why, for instance, in chapter 2, verse 17, we'll read there, I have not come to call the righteous but sinners. Or in chapter 10, verse 45, it says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. These statements take us to the very mind and the heart of Jesus, allows us to hear from his own lips what his own mission was, so that when he says he has come to preach, we know that his purpose is for others to come to salvation to become part of the church, to give themselves in the service of Christ and of others. And that's why when he proclaims in verse uh, later on, the time has come, the kingdom is near, repent and believe the good news. But of course, we all, when Jesus proclaims these things to us, we all, like the Galileans who were there, have our own agendas about Jesus. And we need to be careful those people, and, and it wasn't wrong for them to desire the healing of their relatives or freedom for their nation or whatever else it might be. But Jesus' response is important here. In the context of prayer, he travels throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. And our response is to be similar. Yes, we, we, 
we cannot be Jesus, but we can do these things insofar as we can share the good news and we can live for him because he's transforming our hearts. And the next little section uh, of the story of the man with leprosy from verse 40 through to verse 45 tells us how that is so, where the Lord heals. Because one particular act of Jesus speaks to us very clearly of Jesus' heart, of Jesus' calling, as it were. Some news has obviously got out beyond the, 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 if we want to put it like this, the ordinary community, to people who are outside, to those who are excluded, to lepers. And it had stirred one poor soul to have a flicker of hope in what is otherwise a hopeless life. We'll have some conception, won't we, about the isolation that leprosy brought to those who suffer with the disease when we think about how we were separated from loved ones during the pandemic. But here is an individual, someone who is emboldened by this flicker of hope to break through the ceremonial restrictions that pushed him to the fringes, to push him, push him beyond the fringes of society, to outside people's lives, to outside the community. We don't know the context in which he came to Jesus. We don't know whether there's a crowd around. I don't think there was. Whether Jesus and his disciples were alone, probably. But whatever the context, here he comes and he throws himself down before Jesus on his knees and with a piteous cry he asks Jesus to help him. And we need to understand this miracle. It is a parable as well as a miracle. It tells us a story about Jesus. Leprosy, don't forget, was exceptionally treated in the Old Testament law. There was particular reference to it in the Old Testament law. There were restrictions that were placed upon an individual, but there was also a ritual for the very rare cases in which the disease was cured. But leprosy, as far as society was concerned, was an emblem of sin with its slow, stealthy, steady, corrupting progress in people's lives. There was no known cure. There was no hope. Ultimately, the result was someone's death. And yet there are truths here for each of us because the leper's actions show us what we all need to do. His cry where he knows and recognizes his own misery and his own failure and the fact that there's nothing that he can do about his situation, it impels him to a passionate desire for healing. He knows himself and he knows that there is no hope. Do we know the misery of our sin as well as this man knew the misery of his sickness? Do we really grasp the fact that sin ravage us, ravages us in ways that are less known by us than by those who see us? We can think about ourselves as being relatively spiritually healthy. But we can see in others failures. But God shines a light in our heart by his word so that we can see ourselves the way we are. The difficulty with sin is that the worse we are, the less we know it. So this man then is where by a parable of Jesus. In contrast to many of no eagerness to know, he wants cleansed. He wants his disease cleansed but we should understand that that means forgiveness. And yet there's a confidence here because he knows that Jesus can do something about his life. He was quite sure from what he had heard, the little that he had heard that had seeped out into the leper community to those who are outside. He was quite sure that Jesus had the power to heal. 
And even in the isolation that leprosy brings, he knew enough about Jesus and he spoke to Jesus with faith. A very small and feeble expression of faith, we might say, but it was there. And if we haven't yet come to know him, do we really understand Jesus' forgiveness and the ability that he has to forgive sins? Because forgiveness is possible even for the foulest sinner. And yet there still lingered a doubt in his heart, and so he begged Jesus. And he said, if you're willing, you can do this. He had no right, and he knew he had no right to presume upon Jesus' willingness. But he throws the responsibility for his continued leprosy or otherwise onto Jesus' shoulders. If you're willing, you can do something about this. And here's the good news. Here is where certainty comes in. Because Jesus forgives those who come to him. And how did the Lord respond? Well, Mark tells us he was filled with compassion. Compassion is derived from the word for guts or inward parts, if we want to describe it like that. It describes the kind of empathy that rises from deep within our being. It's as if Jesus is saying to this man, you matter to me so much that I will do for you what no one else can do. And that is when he did the most astonishing thing, where he reached out his hand and touched the man. This was before the leper was clean. This was when the man was still disfigured. This is the man who was dressed in rags, who was probably, frankly, soaked in blood and pus, and Jesus touched him. Far from being repulsed from him, Jesus reached out and touched him. It is a simple response that is nothing short of astonishing. I am willing, he says, be clean. There is no lecture, there is no test of sincerity, there is no desire to impress other people. There is an act that changes a man's life forever. Here's a man that was cleansed entirely. This is the gospel. This is the good news. One Bible commentator was writing about Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan. In it, he asked the question, which of the characters in the parable do you aspire to be? There was the priest, there was the Levite, there was the Good Samaritan. Naturally, of course, our response is we would like to be the Samaritan. The reality is we're the man who was robbed. We're the man who has nothing. We're the man who is naked and completely without hope. We shouldn't expect help from religious people because only Jesus ultimately will have compassion on us. And in this story, we're the leper that Jesus comes to heal, to forgive, to cleanse. But we need to recognize our own sin. But the scriptures are also deeper than this for us if we are a professing Christian and if we walk in the way of Jesus. Because it also means that we do what Jesus does. It means we are to have compassion on others. We are to be moved in our very beings for people. We need to look around us, the people here and others outside, and ask the question, am I moved in my very soul for all of these people? Is it our desire under the Lordship of Jesus Christ to care more for them than we do for ourselves? Are we prepared to go way out on a limb to touch the unclean? Because that is our calling. So Jesus warns the man not to tell anyone, but instead to go and fulfill the requirements of the law. 
Leviticus chapter 4, verses 4 to 32, sets out what the priest's responsibility would be in order to declare if a leper is cleansed. Unfortunately, this man didn't want to do this, but Jesus didn't want undesirable publicity because it would hinder his primary calling. So he responded to his cleansing by doing that which Jesus told him not to do. It was deeply frustrating, for it puts Jesus under pressure in a manner that was not helpful. So when we come to Jesus, when we put our trust in Jesus, the one who has compassion upon us, the one who touches us in our uncleanness, then we must seek to obey him. And it's when we lose sight of that that difficulties come. Mark makes it very clear that Jesus came to proclaim the kingdom of God, the good news. It would result in the destruction of the forces of evil. Jesus came to announce and by his life and death and resurrection to bring about the redemption of the world. Satan clearly will not lie down under this. He will continually seek to deflect Jesus from his mission and he still tries to deflect us from our mission. And wherever we literally sit today, whether as a follower of Jesus or not, all of us need to recognize what God has done for us in him, to receive the forgiveness that is ours through Christ, then to live for him and for his glory and not for ourselves. Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the forgiveness and the cleansing that we find in Jesus. May that be our experience this very day. For Christ's sake, amen. Let's reflect upon that as we sing our final praise. We remember that Jesus paid it all.
the very God of peace, sanctify you wholly and preserve you blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.